So in that Stroop model, we just simply kind of clamped the prefrontal cortex neurons on, and even though we kind of adjusted the strength of those prefrontal cortex connections, we didn't really answer the question, this homunculus question, how does the prefrontal cortex know what task neurons to activate in the first place? Where do those come from? How do, how do, they, how do they get activated? That's really the key question for making the prefrontal cortex smart. And our answer is that there's some kind of interaction with the basal ganglia that enables selection of appropriate task states. And so this is this idea that we can go from basal ganglia action gating, uh, where you pick the most kind of you know appropriate rewarding response. Uh, instead, we can think about that in a cognitive context uh, as selecting the most appropriate rewarding uh, goal. Yeah, so these five different loops through the prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia, and you can have a gating signal kind of process in prefrontal cortex in addition to each of these other levels. Um, and so the basal ganglia at every level is really playing the same function of helping choose the right thing to do that's going to be most rewarding. And our particular idea about how this works is in terms of toggling or uh, essentially latching the active maintenance. And so the idea is that if the basal ganglia is not firing, then the prefrontal cortex will have intrinsic kind of loops of excitatory connections that will cause individual neurons to fire and activate other neurons, and then they reciprocally kind of co-activate each other, and you get this kind of positive feedback loop that sustains the neural activity over time. And this is really a classic idea that's been supported in a number of models and empirical studies. And so the basal ganglia, essentially, when it's not firing, when it's in its default mode, uh, if you recall, the output of the basal ganglia is this SNR, uh, also in, known as the GPI. Um, and these neurons are firing away um, and inhibiting the thalamus and sort of preventing any disruption of this ongoing maintenance of activity in the frontal cortex. And then uh, if the basal ganglia does get a kind of input that causes the go pathway neurons to outcompete the no go pathway and inhibit that tonic activity, okay, uh, then that disinhibits the firing of these thalamic neurons and you get essentially this big burst or wave of activity between the frontal cortex and the thalamus. And we think that's really critical for essentially turning on, updating, and latching a new pattern of activity in the frontal cortex. And so in this diagram, you can see here with yellow being the active neurons uh, that we've switched from this you know, one pattern here to now we're maintaining this new pattern reflecting the kind of new inputs coming in uh, from the posterior cortex. All very kind of cartoon representations of these things. And there are computational models that we'll go through that kind of show how this can actually result in uh, stable active maintenance and selection of appropriate task representations. And so our version of this we call the prefrontal cortex basal ganglia working memory model, PBWM. Um, and it's essentially that same diagram I showed you earlier, uh, where we have the prefrontal cortex holding on to this kind of task context goals. Uh, task states, etc., and the basal ganglia playing this role of essentially updating, uh, toggling on and off those actively maintained states according to a history of learned reinforcement from the dopamine pathways uh, based on what has worked in the past. So well, let's look at this system in the context of a very simple working memory task. So our simple task we call the store ignore recall task and it really boils uh, working memory down to its bare essence uh, you store something you hold on to it while you ignore other things that might be distracting and that's actually a critical aspect of working memory as compared to simple short-term memory and then you have to retrieve that information that you previously stored and so if we look at how the model works here i just click a step trial uh, we see in the input that we have some kind of signal in the environment that's telling us it's time to store this information. Uh, and we're not 
you know, they were really simplifying everything. So this is like, who cares what this is? It's just some cue, uh, could be context, could be all kinds of different things that tells us um, this is something that's important. We should hold on to it. Uh, we get uh, also one of four different arbitrary stimuli, A, B, C, D, and that's the thing we're supposed to hold on to. So this is what we get is an S and a D. And now we go to our next trial. And in this case, uh, it was an immediate recall trial. So we just have to retrieve that D that we got. And you'll notice that we don't get any new input here. Uh, we're just trying to retrieve uh, here at the output layer, uh, the item that we had previously maintained. Randomly generated. So we just get what we get. Here. And so now finally, we got a store trial here where we got store A and then the next trial is an ignore trial. And here, critically, the system gets this kind of distracting input, this D that's coming in, and somewhere in the prefrontal cortex over here, if the model's behaving correctly, it should have held on to the A and be holding on to that in this kind of active memory form, this delay period maintained activity. And then when we get the retrieval cue, um, uh, here we get another ignore trial, so they're random, so we can get fairly long periods. Here's another one. This is a good test. Finally, we get the retrieval queue, the re recall trial, and it's supposed to output A. And I'll note that we're seeing the A here because we've, we're looking at the plus phase. If we look at the minus phase, we can see that the model did not get this correct, as we would expect. This model really is starting out with kind of random initial weights. It has no idea how to hold on to this information, what information should be held on to. And it learns that purely through this kind of dopamine based reinforcement learning, driving the go and the no go pathways in the basal ganglia of the model. We use the word matrix to refer to the uh, MSNs, the medium spiny neurons in the particular matrix matrix subcompartment of the striatum also because we love the word matrix and the movie matrix <laughs> um, so uh, that's why we call it matrix so this is the striatum and the go the go and the no-go pathways going into the gpe which is the gpe no-go pathway and then we kind of combine the effects of the gpi uh, which is the output and the thalamus um, so this kind of disinhibition turns into a net excitation it's easier to see it's easier to deal with in this model uh, and so now you can see kind of which pathways are activated in firing essentially a go. Um, and then that drives updating of the working memory in prefrontal cortex. And we can train this model and then look at the trained model to see exactly how that updating works as it kind of goes through the whole system. And now we can see uh, here the model training going through all these different trials of experience, doing this task over and over again. Uh, over here, we can see the dopamine pathway. We have a kind of raw reward based on whether we got the right output answer. And then there's a prediction of whether we're gonna get reward. And this is the kind of key uh, case here. We're looking at the Viscorla-Wagner version of the dopamine pathway. Uh, it turns out we don't need the full power of the TD or the Pavlov biologically based model. In this case, a simple Rescorla-Wagner model works. And so the, the SNC here, this final dopamine pathway, is actually reflecting the difference between when we get a reward relative to the prediction of that reward. And I can just run that again. And uh, you can see these uh, bursts and dips of dopamine happening uh, as the model is learning the task. Uh, sometimes it starts to get an expectation that drives a dip. Um, and so when it gets a burst of dopamine that reinforces the go pathway, and when it gets a dip of dopamine that reinforces the no go pathway, you can see then the balance between the go and the no go is reflected in whether the model is gating here in, in the end pathway of the GPI thalamus. And then that gating signals, those gating signals are driving the extent to which the prefrontal cortex is updating its memory representations. And actually, as we see the model train up here, uh, one of the key things that you can start to see is when uh, some of the, the maintenance stripes back here in the PFC are starting to hold on to information over multiple trials. You can see them kind of slow down and stop here. This one actually seems like it's getting a little bit stuck. It's holding on to the ignore information, which is not so adaptive. 
um, and it's not doing such a great job of holding on to the store information. As the model starts to latch on and try different strategies of gating, it gets this pattern of reinforcement and punishment. Eventually it will seize upon this goal of holding on to the kind of store trials, um, and then that's when it finally starts to succeed on the task. And here we're tracking over time the learning performance of the model. Um, you can see the kind of percent correct, the percent error in this graph. Um, we can look at the absolute level of dopamine in this green line that tells us how much kind of dopamine overall is getting uh, generated. Um, and we can see its predictions of overall level of reward, how well it thinks it's doing. Um, and so it gives you a nice tracking of the performance of the model over time. And now we can step trial by trial here. Let's get a store trial. So we got a store, and you can see here we're, we're uh, activating these patterns. And these stripes, these we call these different uh, kind of subgroups of prefrontal cortex neurons, stripes, they're independently gatable. We have, so we have four different uh, stripes of prefrontal cortex that we can independently gate. Part of the learning process is exploring in parallel, uh, each one kind of trying out different strategies and uh, that greatly speeds up the learning because it can search through kind of different strategies in parallel instead of doing it sequentially over time. And so here we can see that, you know, it has gated in uh, information into these two stripes. And how we can tell that is that these neurons in the maintenance layer, which we associate with the deep layers of the cortex, uh, is, is those guys are activated. And that's a result of these two uh, neurons here firing. And uh, so these kind of are in correspondence. It's these two rightmost stripes of the maintenance layer. It also did this kind of output gating over here, um, which we'll get to in a second. Um, uh, that's what these other two stripes are showing. So uh, overall, it's now encoded this kind of store D signal into two separate uh, kind of parts of this maintenance area in prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, you can see why it was actually kind of hedging its bets here. Um, this uh, one of those guys has now gated again, and that's resulting in the updating and holding on to this ignore trial information in this first stripe. But critically, you can see back here that one of those stripes, the, the back one, is still holding on to the original store signal. This has the key information uh, that it was the D that we were supposed to hold on to. And now as we go again, we get the retrieval queue um, that is able to read out from output gating. And so now this is the other key part that the, the model has to learn to do is in this other part of the uh, GPI thalamus, which is mapped over here to the output part of prefrontal cortex, we have this additional idea that uh, when it's time to use information that you're holding on to in working memory, uh, you have a separate gating decision to output gate that information and use that to control behavior. And so that is actually what's responsible for transferring this kind of activity from the uh, maintenance layers over here back over to the output deep layers and that all happened in time to generate, as we can see over here in the minus phase, the correct answer of the D that was originally stored. So this is how you go from sort of preparation, holding on, maintaining, preparing for something, and then deciding now it's time to actually act and take that information that I've been preparing and holding on to and use it to control my behavior. This same framework has been used to uh, simulate many, many different types of working memory tasks as we'll go through in a little bit. Uh, so it's very general and you can see quite, quite interestingly, just through this kind of trial and error learning process with these dopamine rewards, it eventually does learn the kind of right strategy. And, and so that essentially helps us get rid of this homunculus, this infinite regress. And we can see that there really are kind of concrete mechanisms involving what we know is actually going on in these different brain areas in the prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia that enable the system over time through learning to kind of be smart.